The Cunard Line flagship Queen Mary II is often referred to as the last of the great ocean liners. Ordered by Cunard in the year 2000 and built at Le Chantier de l'Atlantique shipyard in France, Queen Mary II is the first true transatlantic ocean liner put to sea since QE2 entered service in 1969. Designed by Carnival Corporation's Chief Naval Architect Stephen Payne, who oversaw a team of naval architects, QM2 is a feat of marine engineering and has an expected service life of at least 40 years. When QM2 entered service in 2004, she was the longest, tallest, widest, largest and most expensive passenger ship ever created. And to this day, she holds the title of the largest ocean liner ever built. In the years since, the ship has become a firm favourite among thousands of travellers across the globe. QM2's unique, one-off ocean liner design is both powerful and elegant. The ship's appearance, size and onboard reputation attracts crowds of onlookers at ports all around the world. Yet despite her fame, there are still some parts of the QM2 story that remain a mystery, even to regular travellers. Why, for example, does the ship have an enormous breakwater on the bow? Why were pods selected to move the ship rather than propellers that had been used on all transatlantic liners before her? What is the connection between QM2's luxury spa facility and the ship not having a rudder? And what's with the ship's unusual layout and the strange corridors to access the Queen's room? To answer these questions and more, I spoke with QM2's designer, Dr. Stephen Payne. Queen Mary II is the only ship that regularly transits the North Atlantic Ocean. This route requires the ship to be able to handle rough and stormy weather that the Atlantic is known for. As the first true transatlantic liner to be designed in a generation, Stephen Payne says that looking back at the success of liners of the past was essential in designing Queen Mary II for the future. There's a billion dollars on offer. Cunard have not built a new ship like this since QE2, so there's nobody at Cunard who knows. Yeah. And they said, um, you've got the knowledge of what works within the cruise industry. So put together a design, show us, yep. i.e. the carnival management, if we like it, then you take it to Cunard and get their buy-in. Um, so that, that was the process. One of the things I did was to look at as many of the older ships as possible, find things that had worked on them, and then bring them together into Queen Mary too. Having sailed on Rotterdam, the old Rotterdam, her forward end was enclosed um, or semi-enclosed. So that, that's why I got inspiration for doing the, the boat deck layout of, of Queen Mary too. And then various other features. I wanted the, the bridge to you know, um, have some similarity with QE2, but of course we have to have the enclosed bridge wings now to protect all the electronics. The mast, I wanted to look like QE2, and of course the funnel. The trouble with the funnel is the, the height to get under the, the bridge in New York. To make the funnel work, I had to uh, extend the wind scoop much higher than on QE2, but that, that really makes the funnel effective. One of the unique features of Queen Mary II that was inspired by another ship is the ship's breakwater. A large, curved structure, the breakwater sits at the forward end of Deck 6, and it is there to deflect water away from the forward superstructure. The French liner Normandy inspired this design, which protects QM2 during the Atlantic crossings by ensuring that the large and powerful waves do not crash into the large windows at the forward end of Queen Mary II. Well, and an interesting thing, in fact, with all the windows of that forward part of the ship and also the ones um, in the other public rooms the British Coast Guard um, asked us to design the ship in such a way that we could put the metal shutters on the exterior of those windows when it was going to be storm conditions and you look at the old queens and even on the Rotterdam up at the forward end there are all the fixings to put big metal shutters over the windows and we said you know you we just can't 
put metal shutters on those windows on that forward superstructure or, or along the side of the ship. So there, there's a, a very good thing in the, in the SOLAS, the Safety of Life at Sea regulations, which is equivalence. So we're able to say, look, if we make the glass thick enough and strong enough to be as if we've got the metal shutter in place, will you allow us just to have the glass? And they allowed us to do that. And that's why um, it's laminated and, and there are three or four layers because it's the equivalent of having the metal shutter there. Another unique feature of the QM2's design is her stern. From the open deck, it appears curved like a traditional cruiser stern found on the ocean liners of yesteryear. Yet from the waterline, it appears to be boxier, reminiscent of the transom stern used in today's modern cruise industry. Known as a Constanzi stern, this design blends the traditional cruiser stern with the modern and efficient transom. This allows maximum efficiency and strength, which is essential for transatlantic travel. That came about is because for hydrodynamic efficiency, the transom is best. Um, it falls the flow of water into thinking the ship's longer and therefore it's easier to push through the water than, than a cruiser stern. The trouble is in rough weather when the ship is pitching, the great flat transom coming in and out of the water, you get a lot of wave action underneath. I remembered that an Italian naval architect in the 60s called um, Costanzi, he had this hybrid transom cruiser stern. So I went to the yard and I said, that's what we, we want. I must say they were fairly skeptical. We then built the mock-up and put it through the model tests and it, it worked fine, so that, that, that's what we have. The first ocean liners were paddle steamers. They used coal-powered steam engines to turn large paddle wheels, which in turn moved the ship. Propellers eclipsed this technology, becoming the dominant form of propulsion for over a century. Although steam engines continued to power ocean liners for decades, by 1987, even the QE2, QM2's direct forebear, had been converted to use diesel engines. Queen Mary 2 is different. A combination of diesel engines and gas turbines generate electrical power which feed giant Rolls-Royce pods. These pods, of which there are four, are suspended from the aft of the ship's hull under the waterline. The pods each weigh the same as a jumbo jet. Yep, you heard that right. They pull the ship through the water, and as two of the four pods can rotate 360 degrees, they also act as the rudder. Thus, they eliminate the need for a traditional rudder and are highly efficient, but QM2's design pushed this technology to its limits. Never before had pods been called upon to drive an ocean liner across the Atlantic at speeds of up to 30 knots. Using pods, we, we save about 7 to 8% fuel compared if we just had normal shafts. She needed the four because of the power required. She's already got the largest pods um, on a commercial ship. Originally, I designed the ship to have two pods and a center propeller, but the amount of power that would be required on the center propeller was so high that it um, was predicted the vibrations would be too much. And originally, there was going to be a rudder as well. The idea was on the early pods, they were steered using a hydraulic system, and the hydraulic system, there's always some what we call hunting where it doesn't stay in a fixed position, it sort of wobbles. And I thought with the ship traveling at such high speed and the pods wobbling, it would sort of snake across the Atlantic rather than going straight across. So my idea was to lock the pods and steer using the rudder. And then very early on in the project, Rolls-Royce came to me and they said, we will develop an electric steering a mechanism for the pods so as soon as they did that and i knew that the the pods would be able to be precisely controlled i was able to delete the rudder and the steering gear and get a credit for that this credit or reduction in the cost of the originally proposed propulsion system allowed stephen payne and his team to refocus on the ship's interior and it is here where the removal of the rudder and QM2's luxury spa, designed by Canyon Ranch, are linked. We had set out the spa and the design of the spa, and then Howard Frank, who was the deputy chairman of Carnival, 
he went on vacation to Canyon Ranch, enjoyed the experience so much, he said he wanted Canyon Ranch on the Queen Mary too, to change everything that had already, all the work that had previously been done. The shipyard wanted an extra cost. And so basically deleting the rudder and the steering gear aid for the new spa. QM2's Britannia restaurant is one of the grandest rooms to ever go to sea. Spanning three decks, it occupies the full width of the ship. A uh, passenger ship doesn't really pivot on the waves in the middle. It pivots about two-thirds from the bow. So this was the first space that I... Right. Yes, thought, it Because I wanted it to be as stable as possible if the weather got rough. And was it always going, in your mind, was it always going to be this grand? Oh, yeah. It was always going to be a multi... Because um, you've said before in previous conversations on the channel that you wanted a ship of state dining room for everyone. Yeah, that's right. Which is such a huge difference to the previous ocean liners. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, no, absolutely. So was it always going to be this grand? Yes, I always envisioned it like this, the um, grand dining room on the Normandy for like, and, mm. you know, the original Queen Mary's main dining room was this sort of epic size. Yeah. And I really thought if we design the space correctly, we could get the 1,300 people in each sitting. And, yeah. And what, what is amazing, though, is when you think Britannia, Kennard's first built ship yeah. would actually fit in this room. Incredible. It is unbelievable. The Queen's Room Ballroom, a hallmark of Cunard's ships, is found aft of the Britannia restaurant by getting passengers from the forward end of the ship to the Queen's Room without having them traipse through the Britannia restaurant was a real challenge for the designers and one which called upon the creation of a special hidden deck known as Deck 3L, which is perhaps one of the most controversial aspects of the ship's design. Um, there's a tremendous amount of criticism um, about those uh, walkways. Um, a lot of people don't like them and that, but the position of the storerooms basically dictates where the galley is, and the galley obviously then has a knock-on of where you put the main dining room. And I wanted the main dining room to be two thirds aft that is the um balance point for the ship motion so i wanted it there so that you would feel the motion the absolute least in the dining room and it's the same with the um the duplex apartments that's why they're um two thirds along the length of the ship at the end of the superstructure because that's the least um motion so that was there and then obviously we forward of that, we have the, um, the chart room and Sir Samuel's and the golden lion on, on the deck below. And we were trying to find a way for people to get obviously past the dining room into the queen's room. And with that, um, dining room being so big and the four and a half meters of each deck and having two decks, um, it, I forget. I must admit, I didn't come up with the idea of, of having those sort of hidden walkways. Uh, but um, it was a brilliant idea and, um, yeah, work, works very well. Queen Mary 2 is a truly unique ship with lots of features to explore. And I hope this video has shown you just some of the things that make her unique. If you have any questions about Queen Mary 2's design, please ask them in the comments below and I'll do my best to answer them. Anything I don't know the answer to, I'll pass on to Stephen Payne for consideration in another video. I hope you found this video interesting. If you love the Queen Mary 2 like I do, don't forget to check out my QM2 playlist. There's heaps of videos about the ship for you to enjoy. Thanks once again, and until next time, I hope to see you on board. This video was brought to you by me and my new book, The Evolution of the Passenger Ship. In the evolution of the passenger ship, we bring years of research together to create a book that takes you on a journey from the dawn of passenger shipping right the way through to the modern cruise behemoths that we see today. The evolution of the passenger ship is available at all good bookshops, and if you purchase a copy, you help us, which helps support the channel.